my name is Mariana San Martin, and I'm here with my colleagues Ben Ferns and Camila Salazar, that they will both uh, present. I don't know if you both uh, want to uh, quickly present yourself, and then I can start. Yeah, so I can. So hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Camila, and I am the lead data analyst at OCP. So we will be talking a bit about the value of open data and what you can actually do with contracting data from the city of New York. Thanks, Mariana and Camila. Hi, I'm Ben Burns. I'm the Global Head of Infrastructure at the Open Contracting Partnership. Really excited to be here. So thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, thanks also uh, to the team for inviting us. Back to you, Mariana. Great. Thank you very much. So now uh, I can start. Um, well, as we said, we are the Open Contracting Partnership, uh, and we are with you today to talk about what open contracting means for cities. So why public procurement? Every year, governments spend huge sums of money through contracts on everything from pencils to building major infrastructure projects such as airports. The global spending on this is over 13 trillion each year. That is a pile of one dollar notes stretching from the earth to the moon and back and again to the moon. One third of every dollar spent by government is on government contracts. However, procurement is government number one corruption. Almost 60% of foreign bribery cases prosecuted under the OECD Anti-Bribery Convention involve bribes to obtain public contracts. And over 30% of companies in the European Union tell us corruption prevented them from winning a contract. We talked about this 13 trillion being spent on public contracts every year. And from this, nearly two thirds is handled at the subnational level in OECD countries. This excludes procurement led by cities. So this number is likely even bigger and probably growing in the context of increased localization. COVID has exacerbated these challenges. Crisis situations are ripe for corruption due to increased funding levels. In this case, when governments spend more than 100 billion on COVID contracts in the first month, in the first four months of pandemic only, also because of reduced financial controls and frequently changing new actors. So these low levels of transparency, digitalization and coordination created a sort of Hunger Games scenario where hospitals, public health agencies and governments competed to purchase essential equipment, medicines and services. But the problem is not always corruption. It can just be incompetent or inefficient. This is an example of what can happen when project planning and coordination breaks down. Here you can see a public project in a Lithuanian school with some obvious problems. First, that there are no cubicles. And second, that it was meant to be a change room. So what can we do about it? And this is where we can help. What is then open contracting? OCP works with governments, businesses and civil society to transform public procurement to deliver better goods, services, and works for everyone. Using the power of open data and effective participatory mechanisms, we help to reduce corruption, improve efficiency, enhance competition, build credibility and trust, and deliver better value for money. At the core of our work, we have two open data standards, OCDS and OC4IDS, which help stakeholders publish and use standardized, structured, machine-readable open data in a timely manner, so it is easier to understand what works and what doesn't work. And from there, it's easier to introduce, to introduce reform. OCP is nowadays working in over 30 countries. It has been endorsed by the G20, and it is an open government partnership norm with over 189 OCP commitments at national action. Plan. Over the last six years, our work with partners have shown that open contracting can make a big difference in improving service delivery when it is done right. What do I mean with done right? With being done right. This means when there is a timely, high-quality open data, when businesses and civil society have a voice, and when the government listens. And in these cases, open contracting has led to significant savings and improved services to citizens. As I mentioned, the open data approach enables benefits such as increased competition, lowering, lowering prices, more effective procurement for governments, improving service delivery, better access for SMEs, women and minority-owned businesses, and fighting corruption among many others. In addition to helping partners with implementation of their reforms, we are dedicated to documenting their impact too. I will mention some examples shortly. Here, I will stop uh, for a second and give you a better sense of what we mean with open contracting. Opening up procurement means both opening up data and opening up collaboration with the reform beneficiaries, companies, and civil society. To do this, we start with governments publishing their contracting data. And then we work with internal and external stakeholders to make sure this data gives evidence on how to improve. The drawing that you can see on the right shows how we think of open contracting being an iterative process. 
This map shows you the process of implementation of the open contracting data standards globally. Camila will talk more about this, but for now, I will just highlight that the standard enables disclosure of data and documents at all stages of the procurement process from planning to implementation. It also provides guidance on both what to publish and how to publish it, making it easier to compare and analyze data. And now I will give you some examples of what open contracting can do in cities. In the case of Bogota, Colombia, they transformed the procurement system of school meals from closed to open. This showed the existence of a price fixing schema where suppliers colluded to keep, to keep prices high. For example, chicken drumsticks were being charged at $20 per drumstick, which was four times higher than in market. And many school meals were not delivered to schools, even though they had been paid. In addition, it was discovered that the way school meals were tendered prevented suppliers from participating as they were required to both provide the food and distribute it to school. So the open contracting approach enabled the procurement process to be reformed, and as a result, supplier diversity increased by over 350% and the quality of the food increased. In the case of the city of Buenos Aires, the government had two goals. First, to improve the efficiency in the way infrastructure was planned, procured, and delivered. And second, to improve public trust in government. First, the, war, the government was fragmented and sealed. It was operating multiple different systems, platforms, and formats, which made it really hard for them to coordinate. And this happens in many, many governments. And this also meant that public officials had to respond to identical information requests from different offices many, many times. From the side of citizens, they were also frustrated because of the disruptions faced from public work construction, where they didn't have visibility on what was happening or why it was happening. So the city government created an open infrastructure portal called Bea Obras that joined up key information on infrastructure projects, making it accessible online. From Bea Obras, we have seen huge efficiency gains, such as 93% reduction in time for city officials to collect and share data, and 75% less time spent on research by journey. Both government supervision and TSO monitoring of public works has improved and the number of citizen complaints have been reduced. Businesses have also reported that this data is helping them to better plan their supply chains and which in turn enables them to participate in incoming terms. And the last example I will tell you about is not exactly a city, but I wanted to mention a very interesting example from Taiwan that we are replicating also in India. Our partners in Taiwan join up public procurement data with flood data to help governments identify areas in greatest need of flood defense infrastructure. Here you can see in the slide that there were already some discrepancies in past procurement, where some areas with few floods received significant spending and others with lots of floods had much less spending. And in India, we are doing something like this, but adding socioeconomic indicators to analyze this. I wanted to present this example because it's pretty, very relevant for the problems we are having globally this day. And now I will let Camila uh, tell you more about the data itself that allows this kind of panel. Uh, thank you so much, Mariana and everyone for joining this session. And I guess in this part, I wanted to showcase uh, the value of procurement data and why procurement, procurement matters and having open data sets on procurement is really helpful for us citizens just to monitor spending. So if we go to the next slide, um, uh, one of, as Mariana said, open contracting is basically about two things. So in one part, we work with governments and with different stakeholders on how to push reforms to make public contracts uh, more openly and to deliver better goods and services to citizens. And then that is this other component that is based on open data, having open data published and used uh, in order to share and track the key items of information across the whole process of public procurement. From planning to how you actually award a contract and how this contract is implemented, and just having all those data sets published in a user-friendly, open and standardized way. So that is one of the key principles of open contract. If we go to the next slide. So, uh, and I wanted to start here to th let us think about a procurement process. And uh, I guess sometimes we think that procurement is really, yeah, it's, it's, it's an activity that uh, it's only done in public offices, but it doesn't affect us personally or in any way. And actually there are so many actors participating in the procurement process. Um, and it actually affects us, affect us every day. Like if, if uh, they're different, people participate in a procurement process. And for this, I wanted to share a personal example of how procurement can affect you. So 
Um, I'm a data analyst, but I also love roller skating. So uh, on the weekend, I went to a public skate park and it was closed. And the first thing I said, well, who's responsible for opening this public skate park? So I actually contacted the local government and I realized that the person responsible for this was actually a private vendor that had a contract with the local government to actually open and maintain all those public spaces in in the county. And I went to like the website, I found the contract and I realized that actually one of the penalties of not opening the the parks on time was that there were there were penalties for the supplier. So this was an example of how I was affected as a citizen for not being able to use public spaces because there was a supplier that was not compliant on time and the government was not aware that there was compliance the, the, the contractor was not com- uh, delivering the goods and services it was supposed. So on a procurement process, there are different actors. So you have the government, it could be like a local government or a government agency. You have the suppliers, and then you have citizens as you and me that use those types of services every day. So this was a case of being able to use public spaces, but it could happen again with school meals or infrastructure works that are not completed on time or um, other types of goods and services that the government provides. And throughout this process, all these different actors interact and have a role on documenting and monitoring how uh, actually procurement is done. So if we go to the next slide and going back to like the process itself, throughout this different process and to be able to monitor how public money is being spent, there are different types of information that are generated across the process. So uh, you can go, and I didn't add here like the planning stage, but if we go back to how actually like a government agency has a a procurement plan and forecast the upcoming opportunities uh, for the next year, you will have the documents um, about what are like the contracts that are going to be published and the opportunities that are going to be advertised in the next coming month. If you go now to the to the tender publication or the the where, where the submission of, of bids is opening, there you will have another types of information. So you will have information about who are the agencies uh, procuring goods and services, what types of goods are being um, uh, procured, what's the estimated value of that of that purchase. Um, how many, for instance, uh, bidders actually submitted interest um, to, to submit bids. And then if we go through the other stages of the process, once uh, the tender is awarded and the contract signed, then you would have other types of information and data that could be disclosed in this different state. And besides that, besides the process itself, you will have information also about, for instance, about the vendors that are registered in in the city or in the agency as well. And all that information, if we go to the next slide, is actually and can be transformed into data. And what we mean by data is that sometimes procurement runs uh, similar to an image like this, that it, it sometimes runs on paper or is scattered across different systems. And the idea and how we work with governments is actually helping them on how to go from this to actually structured and open data. Because all of those types of informations that you can disclose across the process can actually be structured in an open and standardized way. If we go to the next one, uh, and what we mean by structured information is data that information that can be processed by a computer. So you can have, for instance, a PDF of a contract online. But what we mean by data is actually having something that looks, and this is just a really simple table, but kind of looks like this, where you actually have this aggregated information on the different stages of the process. So you would have, for instance, an award ID and how much was awarded and then who uh, were the suppliers or the vendors that were awarded that contract. And that's why we mean like by structured data. Um, At OCP, we actually help governments, and as, as, as Mariana was saying, we actually support two data standards on how to disclose procurement information on an open and standardized way. And the idea is uh, that with the open contracting data standard, you can actually link the different stages of the process and disclose data fields across those stages in a standardized way. So in each of the stages, you can actually track uh, from where that contract was planned to when was it published, when was it awarded, and how is it being implemented on, on time. And throughout the stages, there are different recommended data fields that you can actually disclose. Um, go ahead. 
also, and, and just to be clear in this, and since we work like on, on, on different countries as well, um, we find that sometimes when we talk about procurement, there are different ways about how this information is disclosed. So um, sometimes uh, what you find on, on a procurement website is just, let's say, a file with the total number of suppliers or a file with the total value awarded by quarter. So those are aggregated statistics of procurement information. But what we actually advocate for is having disaggregated information about the procurement process itself. So we want information and we advocate for information to be published for each procedure so that you're able to track the dates, the values, who are the participants or stakeholders involved in that process? What are the items being procured? So we aim for having disaggregated information instead of just having aggregated statistics about procurement data itself. And the idea of this is for this information to be available for everyone as open data. And since this is Open Data Week, I'm pretty sure uh, you know what we mean by open data. That is basically data sets that can be freely used, used distributed by anyone and um, you can actually download the data set and let's say create an app for um, for upcoming opportunities that can help vendors to better bid for contracts just for an instance so that's the idea of having this open data set that can be freely used and reused by everyone um, that 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 wants to um, and the good news is that we actually, like in, in New York City, there's actually an open data portal that has procurement data available. So as you know, in New York, there are different, um, uh, different procurement, how procurement is run on, on different sites, but on the open data side, there is information available as open data. So if we go to the next slide, so for this exercise, and just to showcase you why it is important to like use data, so we actually downloaded two of these data sets uh, on the open data portal about the CD record and the contracts uh, awards a data set as well. Um, and then we just kind of analyze some of this data to showcase what you can actually do and also showcase some of the methodologies that we can use to help government be aware of how usable and what types of things you can calculate with your data. Um, and this is, and we, we have developed these methodologies because one part is just disclosing the data and having those data sets, uh, but the idea and the value of data actually lies in how it can be used when it is analyzed and used for decision making. So in our work, we also advocate for that. So that the data is a tool that government citizens can use to drive for reforms and for better decision making. Um, and throughout our work, we, can, we have actually identified different use cases uh, of procurement data, actually the standard and how we help governments disclose open data on public contracts is based on different use cases. So that the data set is usable for key, uh, key specific in instances of using data to achieve outcomes on pursue a specific goal. So uh, the use cases relate to market opportunities uh, this means, for instance, uh, being able to assess competition in specific markets to see, for instance, the diversity of vendors that are participating in public contracts. How can we increase, for instance, um, opportunities to, to increase participation of women-owned businesses? Um, there are also use cases related to value for money. How can we better procure goods and services for the best for price and best quality? There's also a, a really um, important use case is related to public integrity. That is this part about like, how can we monitor contracts just to make sure that our goods and services are delivered? So for instance, the example that I shared at the beginning of my presentation of me monitoring why is the park closed when I need it, it's an example about how citizens can engage and, and hold authorities accountable on how this contract should be implemented on time. Um, and also, other use cases more related to service delivery, how are those goods and those contracts being implemented in practice? And how can I use data to increase efficiency internally to help me better monitor my contracts internally, better do better planning on upcoming opportunities as well. And throughout our guidance, we have actually uh, developed methodologies uh, for each use case. There are specific indicators that can be calculated. And then we have mapped 
what is the data, the data fields that are more, uh, that you need actually to calculate those indicators to actually measure, let's say, competition in a market or internal efficiency. And use cases are important is because uh, when you have a clear use case on, on the data and, and on the publication, it can help you define clear measurable goals and what metrics are needed to track them. So you're very clear about what you want to measure and what you need uh, to measure those goals. It can help you also prioritize the data you need to collect, publish, or analyze. So um, if you want to do specific monitoring about who's winning the contracts in your city, then you actually need information about who are the vendors that are winning the contracts. Um, also, identifying the key users of the data publication. So if you have a data set, you can actually start a data set published. You can actually start thinking about who are the key users that might be interested in using the data set. You can actually develop strategies to increase data use. So you can engage with journalists or it could be academia that wants to do research on, on using those data sets as a data source. And also, if you're clear about your goals and 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 use cases, it can help you save time as well. Um, now, if we go to the next slide, so as I said, we downloaded uh, like the open data on on of of New York City of, from the New York City Open Data Portal, and we actually have. Um, so, as I said, we have methodologies. We have a list of around 71 indicators related to those use cases that I shared with you earlier. And we actually map like the fields that were available for the, on, on this, on this data sets and kind of check if you had the fields to calculate some of those indicators related um, to, to different use cases. So for instance, as you can see here, you can actually calculate around 33 of those procurement indicators that mainly relate to market opportunities. So you can actually assess competition in the market, who are the suppliers participating on the market. And you can actually calculate other indicators related to public integrity or internal efficiency as well. So just being able about having uh, a good understanding of what data has been published and using these methodologies to kind of identify what is possible with the data is a resource that we're always happy to share with uh, the partners and stakeholders we work with uh, globally interested in analyzing procurement data. Um, we also run some like just uh, general metrics on the data. So, and, and while we, you run this analysis and when you, why you, when you publish and use that data, you can actually uh, get different findings about what is uh, like the number of awards uh, being awarded by year or um, the, the amount awarded by year. You can actually segment this analysis by month or by quarter so you can better plan about how the spending changes on a seasonal basis throughout a year. Um, if we go to the next one, uh, we actually, there's information about who are the vendors of, um, of, of the main contract. So you can see, for instance, who are the main vendors. And based on this, you can actually see, for instance, who are the, what are the main categories, or if it's technology-based companies, it's probably contracts related to IT or, or, or technology, um, uh, yeah, technology-related contract. So you can actually get an understanding about what's being, who's participating, who are the companies being awarded contract. And you can actually segment this analysis, disaggregate it even further to see, let's say, specific agencies or specific markets um, within the city, just to understand what is, is, is what is being procured and who are the vendors participating in this opportunity. Um, as I said, you can actually segment this by Category. So, how? What's the number of vendors by category as well? And then you could run this analysis uh, by value as well. Um, see, let's say if how the market is divided. So, if there's market concentration of in, in each of, of this market, and all of these analysis that you can do will depend, as I said on the beginning, on your use cases, your objectives, and data availability um, that is there. The good thing, as I said, is that. From the city of New York, there's data available, and it's a matter of yeah, downloading the data, and start thinking about how can I use this data set? What are my objectives? What are my use cases? Um, how can this be helpful for my specific goals and analysis? And it's there's already data there that you can start using. And I'm gonna pause there uh, just in case you have any questions or comment uh, on the data before we jump to uh, our next part. So. Happy to answer any questions. And if not, of course, at the beginning of our presentation, 
we will have uh, a space for yeah for you to reflect on have you used procurement data have you encountered any challenges uh, how can this be useful for the work you do so I'm going to pause there to see if there are um, more questions and if not we can jump to the final a part of our presentation. Hi, uh, my name is Kahini. I have a question just regarding um, some of your experiences working with other governments as well. Um, so in, in your experience, um, you know, you mentioned that in certain instances, like, um, so, you know, you were able to get more transparency about how spending was, um, was done. And I'm curious, like, is that because there aren't laws on the books requiring that information to be public already? And in that case, were you working with governments to kind of proactively share that information? Or was it about changing, excuse me, rules around um, making that information public? So I think it's it's two ways. So in some cases, let's say there are transparency requirements by law. But I guess in most cases, what we found out is, well, first, procurement data, like most of the procurement, the information that can be disclosed in public contracts is actually public information. We're talking about money. It's public money that's being spent to provide goods and services. So in terms of, let's say, confidential information, there's most of the information related to procurement is not confidential, so it can be disclosed. So in our work, it, it's it's a matter of both. So having, I think first having like the buy-in from the government is key. So that they know the value of having these data sets open. And we have examples of uh, governments actually disclosing this data and then using this data internally as well, not only to disclose data as a matter of transparency so that journalists or civil society can monitor, but also internally, it can help them, uh, at, let's say, implement um, different types of internal analysis to better measure um, like how procurement is run as well. In other cases uh, where there's, there's not that much buying from government, we found that actually having an active civil society pushing for the disclosure of this information can be helpful as well. So it can, uh, yeah, advocate for, for, for the openness of contracts. And in the ideal case, what you would have is a government that's willing and that's uh, proactively working in disclosing that information, but you also have civil society that's willing to use that information as well. So when you have that stakeholder collaboration, I think those are the best scenarios and those are the places where we have like the most uh, relevant examples of how this data is being used. Well, so I guess we can run to the last part of the presentation. And at the end, as I said, we will have space for, for other questions or thoughts on procurement. Samila, and thanks, Mariana, uh, for uh, the two great presentations. Um, I'm just going to take a, a few minutes now to run through very quickly some of the support and guidance that we have available for um, you know, many of you on, online here. I know that uh, a lot of this might be new concepts for you, and they might be... Um, uh, it, it might seem really complex, uh, but the good news is that we have uh, some tailored guidance that can help you through this process. So we've been working with uh, with WEF, the World Economic Forum, and the G20 Smart Cities Alliance to develop an open contracting model policy for city implementers. Um, so what I'll do in the next few minutes is just to take you through um, this model policy, uh, which is already online, um, and we'll add a link to it in the chat uh, in a moment as well, so you can go through and, and, and peruse through it. Um, and hopefully this will give you an idea of you know, what are some of the, um, the first steps towards implementing open contracting. And there is also you know, some really good sort of case studies and examples and tools and templates that can help you uh, along the journey. So first up, um, we talked a little bit, Mariana and Camila, about what open contracting actually means and, and how, uh, how we put it into practice. So broadly speaking, there are kind of like three large buckets to this work. So the first bit really is about publishing data in a standardized, structured, machine-readable uh, format, which then makes it easier to use because it's easier to do analysis, it's easier to compare, it's interoperable and things like that. And then once you have that data used, what that means is that you can understand what's working and what's not, and from there, start your process of transformation so that you can start to identify problems in your cooking processes, what's working, what's not, and develop solutions to, to fix it. So that's really what uh, open contracting in the simplest of terms looks like. So here are um, what we're going to like touch very briefly in terms of the model policy. It covers uh, a whole uh, a series of, of different uh, elements that's relevant for city implementers. So in terms of the model policy, first you have the fundamentals of open contracting, some of which you heard from Mariana earlier on, uh, and then also from Camilla in terms of data use. So what is open contracting, what it's all about. 
Um, and then secondly, um, it plugs in how open contracting can help you achieve your broader city goals and policies. So, for example, um, you know, if you might have uh, goals for um, improved efficiency from public procurement spending, or if you might have some sort of social and environmental goals, maybe decarbonization through um, public offices and how can procurement help you to reduce your carbon footprint, for example. You know, those are all things that open contracting can really feed into it's it's not about creating something extra or something additional it's really about um helping to streamline approaches and helping you to achieve the goals and targets that uh, that you want to achieve as part of uh, existing uh, city policies and initiatives now we'll talk a little bit about the governance and accountability of, of, of the policies and how that works, um, you know, what that means. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, participation and civic engagement, both which Mariana and Camila also talked about. And then some of the technical tools, guidance and templates that we have as part of the policy to help you on this process. So broadly speaking, first, the fundamentals of open contracting is to really think about what is your starting point? Um, where is the entry point for this work? And what that means is what is the problem that you want to solve? And again, I think uh, Camilla touched on this really well um, in terms of thinking about your goal, because we don't have to solve everything all at once. You don't have to transform every aspect of public procurement in your city all at once, but you can select something very specific that is a priority to you and then work there and then over time you can scale up or scale across different thematic areas. So for example, Mariana talked about the school meals program in Bogota, which is you know where we really started some very exciting work in, in Colombia. So how to improve the procurement and delivery of school meals for children. Um, in other places, we're doing uh, work relating to uh, environmental um, disaster management. So for example, in Taiwan and India, because for example, in state of Assam, there's lots of flooding and the same with, with Taiwan, um, and that is really their priority there. In other places, um, we've worked on things like medicines and health, uh, again, particularly uh, during the pandemic, uh, that has been really a, a key focus for a, a lot of city governments who are really looking at how they can, um, you know, improve value for money in terms of medicines or, or, or um, health equipment that needs to be procured. So that's a, really the first starting point. So really thinking about what is the problem you want to solve so that you can figure out that entry point. Uh, the second thing is really about uh, being inclusive in the approach. So building those stakeholder relationships and thinking about the actors that are involved um, so that you can be sure uh, through that process of engagement and consultation that you're actually going to be solving real problems and not just something uh, that might be theoretical or, you know, sitting, for example, in a silo and thinking about, you know, what other people might need without actual engagement. And um, then the next thing is really thinking about what capacity exists, right? So what are the skills? What is the experience that you have? And then compared to what is actually needed and how can you start building up that capacity? And so I think those are really, really key problems. And the journey isn't always a linear one. And as I said before, you don't have to solve everything all at once. So that's kind of the the four fundamentals of open contracting. And then I talked a little bit earlier about the relationship to other city initiatives. So again, open contracting very much is about complementing uh, citywide goals, uh, citywide reforms, um, and, and how to help you advance those things. Um, it can also help to catalyze partnerships and innovation. Um, and as I touched on earlier, so it can have broader impacts outside of process improvements for procurement. So things like um, you know, improved competition, value for money, integrity, service delivery, but it can also look at some broader economic, social and environmental priorities. So we talked a little bit about fraud, um, you know, the other social outcomes, for example, in, in some places we're looking at social housing and how that can help to reduce homelessness or, you know, how procurement can help with job creation so that you create shared prosperity. Um, so those are sort of broader goals as well that open contracting can help to deliver. And so it's all really about how procurement can help to drive change and procurement data is a key part. Of so Mariana and Camila also both talked about some of our data standards. So we have obviously the open contracting for infrastructure data standard, the open contracting data standards, so OCBRIDES and OCDS, all of which uh, helps provide a standardized and structured way of publishing, so presenting data that makes it more usable and makes it more interoperable. So um, I know we talk a lot about data and we've talked a lot about, you know, what the data can do for you, but data really is just the starting point. Um, it's uh, very much the start of the journey. The key is really using that data and collaborating with other stakeholders to make sure that that data use can transform 
into something meaningful so it can deliver something that you that you really want and that's something um, that we can't stress enough because I think um, in in some cases where transparency is the end goal you might find that maybe all of your procurement might be open but then in reality nothing else changes right so it's really about kind of whole life cycle transformation and whole systems reform where data is a key part of that but it's not the only part of that and then finally what i'll say on this slide is that uh, perfect shouldn't be the enemy of the good um so everyone can start somewhere and i know that it can be daunting and some people might think, oh, but we're not ready because maybe we don't have the capacity or maybe, um, you know, we don't have regulations that mandate this and it might be too difficult. But everyone can start somewhere. It can be either in a specific agency, uh, on a specific thematic area or with a specific partner or, or something like that. And then the, and then from there, you can you can grow the program incrementally. So the idea is to really think big, start small, and then you can scale fast. And that's, you know, one of the uh, final message that we want to leave with you. So with that, I'm going to hand back um, over to Mariana. And I don't know, uh, Mariana, maybe it's time for questions or or something else. Over to you. Thank you very much, Ben, and thanks, Camilla. Um, I don't know if you um, have any questions, uh, if you want to share uh, some some problems or, or some ideas that all this uh, made you think about. It can be in the case of New York City or or, or as Camila shared, some example on, on, on what happened when, when this doesn't work well. Hi, this is Noel Gosha from NYC Open Data. Um, I'm curious to know a little bit more about um, how you work with um, governments at the local, state, federal level um, in facilitating implementation of these um, best practices around open, open contracting. Yes, sure. I, I can answer and I will also let Camila and Ben uh, answer too. Um, it's, uh, it's, sometimes it's, it's very complex. Like, like we, we, we gave an overview on, on how we normally work with governments, but of course it will depend uh, mainly in the government's needs uh, and what are, um, what the, that they are looking for. Uh, because the, the end goal is not to publish data, but to be able to have data to answer uh, our key questions or, or, or be able to conduct the key improvements that we want. Uh, so first, we, we have to know like where the government is standing, like which data they have, which data they don't have, uh, and what their interest. For example, if they are interested to improve internal efficiency, if they want to improve competition, or it will depend uh, on what they want to do. Um, to move forward. I don't know, Camila and Ben, if you have like any other comments on this. Go ahead, Ben. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Camila. <laughs> you first. No, I was just going to say, yeah, as Mariana was saying, it, it really depends on what uh, what's the government objective and goal uh, but I guess the key the key thing when we when we work with these engagements is just to have like an understanding of where they stand and then how we kind of design strategies or how can we better help them so I think would be to help a government to better disclose data or how to actually let's say um implement some reforms in order to increase the participation of women-owned businesses. So it really depends on what are the main goal. It can be support on the data part, but also support on other strategies that can drive to better procurement outcomes as well. I can, I can jump in quickly uh, just to share a little bit about um, what our support model looks like. Um, so again, um, depending on, on who the agency is or you know which city government it is and what their goals are i mean broadly speaking that we can um, help provide advisory and um, support services across the entire implementation process um so first of all on the data side we have obviously uh, fabulous people like camilla who's our lead data scientist uh, here at ocp who can help with the data work we also have a free, a free global help desk where anybody who's interested in um, publishing or using data uh, on procurement and, and related uh, topics uh, can get support on that. So how to structure data, how to publish it, how to think about visualizing that data so that it becomes more user friendly so that you can create, uh, for example, some data tools, um, uh, maybe some analytics and things like that. Um, 
but also then um, we look at the end goal. And so we do a lot of capacity building and training for government stakeholders, but also civil society actors so that they can uh, use the data to create those kind of transformations that, that, we're, that we're, we're talking about. And similarly, um, with the G20 Smart Cities Open Contracting Model Policy, that's a mouthful, uh, we'll also be uh, running a series of workshops uh, as part of the um, smart city work um, to help uh, city implementers along this journey. So the first point uh, for that is that we're doing an introduction to the open contract model policy on the 17th of March. Um, and I think those details are probably already on our website. And if not, it should go out uh, soon. So I encourage you to check our website, sign up to our newsletter. Um, and we're also on Twitter and LinkedIn and things like that, because that's where you'll get um, the most up to date uh, details on our events uh, and capacity building and workshops and things like that. And then from there, we'll probably do a series of deep dives um, touching each of the kind of pillars of open contracting from publishing data to using data to um, stakeholder participation and engagement, thinking about feedback loops, complaints mechanisms, and how that can help to um, inform uh, the transformation process. So there's a whole raft of, 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 of uh, activities and workshops there. And of course, we have a lot of guidance on our website as well, which uh, you, can, you can peruse at your leisure. Thank you, Camila, and thank you, Ben. And I will also want to uh, present Riley Martin, uh, a colleague from ours that is also here, uh, that is working specifically uh, with US cities, in case she wants to say something else. Just a hi, uh, and thanks folks for attending, and I'll drop my email in. The, the crux is we can help a lot of different ways, but reach out and we can figure that out together. Great, thank you very much, Riley. So she will, uh, she will also share her email over top. And I'm not sure if there is uh, some other question, if not, of course, you have our our emails. We will drop it in the chat too. And, and same with writing. Great. Then thank you everyone for participating. And please let us know if you have any, any questions or any ideas or any comments.